Greetings. Hello to everyone joining us from all over the world for this final IFNEC SMR series in the month of June. If you're joining us for the first time, welcome. If you've participated in some of our other seminar webinars of this month, thank you so much for being a part of this very special program. As you may know, IFNEC is the International Framework for Nuclear Energy Cooperation. It's a 65 country government to government organization that is dedicated to the peaceful uses of nuclear energy. And cooperation is in our name, and that's what our mission is, to be able to develop a cooperative platform among countries all over the world on the peaceful uses of nuclear. This month, we were hoping to have an in-person gathering in Jordan at the Dead Sea to talk about SMRs, deployment of SMRs, and the technology surrounding SMRs around the world. Unfortunately, because of the circumstances of our global pandemic right now, we weren't able to gather in person, but it did help the IFNEC program come to a new level in being able to work remotely and bring people together on a webinar platform like this. It's been a great success thanks to your participation. We've had anywhere from 300 to 500 people participate in each of our Tuesday webinars on, during SMR month. So thank you for participating. I invite you to continue to stay connected with IFNEC. Uh, whether you're a government representative or an industry representative or non-government organization, there is a way to connect with IFNEC and stay connected with your counterparts around the world. So we invite you to follow our Twitter handle, at IFNEC and come to our website, ifnec.org. So today's program is very special. It's based on the Clean Energy Ministerial's initiative called the Nice Future Initiative. I'm gonna give you just a brief overview of what the Nice Future Initiative is, and then I'll hand it over to Tomas, our host for today. The Nice Future Initiative was started as part of the Clean Energy Ministerial just about three years ago now. The Clean Energy Ministerial at the time really didn't have a platform for nuclear, and thus nuclear was not included as part of a clean energy community. Three years ago, the United States and our friends in Japan and Canada got together and created the NICE Initiative, which stands for Nuclear Innovation for a Clean Energy Future. The NICE initiative under the Clean Energy Ministerial has ushered in nuclear as an important part of our clean energy systems around the world. It develops research, promotes innovation, communications, and cooperation, bringing nuclear together with renewables to create clean energy systems. So this is thus the platform for energy synergy, and I'll turn it over to my good friend, Tomas, who is uh, our host for today. Tomas? Thank you, Susie. And hello to everybody. Good morning to some parts. Good afternoon, good evening. As said before, my name is Tomas Jagar. I'm IFNEC Reliable Nuclear Fuel Supply Working Group Co-Chair and also President of Nuclear Society of Slovenia. I'm honored today to be able to moderate this webinar that I strongly believe you will find both interesting and relevant. Let me begin first by extending my sincere thanks to the IFNEC Leadership Council and in particular to the Chair, Susie Jawrowski, for providing us this platform for discussing the most important challenges facing nuclear going forward. Although it's important to develop advanced nuclear technologies, that work will be for nothing unless nuclear can serve as an important contributor to national decarbonization goals, fitting in, fitting in well with the well-supported and expanding renewable energy sources. Of course, I have also to thank our expert panelists who gave their time to developing presentations and in addition participating in what we hope will be a lively panel discussion session at the end. We should remember that at present about 85% huge majority of all global energy needs still are provided by fossil fuels. This is more or less unchanged since 1990s. We cannot contribute as a world on the same track and on international scale countries have responded to this uh, huge climate challenge by committing to reduce the emissions of carbon and setting aggressive decarbonization goals. 
the world is presented with a difficult challenge. We need to reverse the growing reliance on fossil fuels with the, while delivering more electricity and more energy to more people. Addressing this challenge requires an open debate and better understanding of the crucial contribution nuclear can make when deployed in combination with the renewable energy sector. As of today, nuclear remains the only proven scalable and reliable low carbon alternative to fossil fuels, meaning that large reactors will continue to form the backbone of the low carbon energy systems worldwide. Alongside with new nuclear, uh, also the technologies, including several SMR designs. As of today, many do not realize that the contribution of nuclear technology with renewables to the carbonization is significant already now. We have clear examples of countries building together on renewable and nuclear energy sources and already achieving very low carbon emissions from electricity production. Example of exist existing hybrid systems with some of the cleanest grids in the world are, for example, Canada, Switzerland, France. In those countries, nuclear power is currently an important source of low carbon power and also a source of system stability and flexibility. Nuclear maintains electricity security by operating also in base load and in some cases also in load following mode, complementing the supply of variable renewable generation. And with forums like this webinar, it is essential to encourage the dialogue and to spread this news. By working together, we will increase the chances to convey the message that nuclear is a crucial component of clean energy systems. Today's webinar will address energy synergy between nuclear and renewable. The objective of today's webinar is to wrap up what has been done in the previous four webinars in this evening series. They began with market discussions, followed by financing and regulatory discussions, and then last week with many vendors presenting their technology development stories. Today, we will first hear a story from a Slovenian utility that is successfully operating an electricity grid with large shares of nuclear and renewable. They are actually doing what this webinar is about. How are they successfully balancing capacity on the grid? What are the market advantages of operating a hybrid system? This will be followed by a senior government energy planning representative from Argentina discussing how they are working toward the energy transitions necessary to meet national goals. We will then hear from two representatives from prestigious research centers that are working on the challenges of integrating renewable and nuclear sources into clean hybrid energy system of the future, including not only electricity, but also heat and hydrogen. We will close today webinar with the perspectives from researchers at two universities on their approaches to developing hybrid system. Before I recognize our next speaker, I would like to talk shortly about how this webinar will proceed. First, we will open our floor to, pan, uh, to six panelists, and then uh, we will open it for the panel discussion, where we'll be also chance to answer interesting questions that you might have submitted. If you would like to pose a question, you can use the question and answer function on the bottom of your screen and write your question. This is also an opportunity to provide observations and comments, so we encourage all to participate through this function. We will monitor the submission and answer of your question as part of the concluding panel discussion. For those questions that are left, we will find the written questions and answers as part of the webinar, webinar record on the IFNEC website. And with this, I would like to conclude my opening remarks and introduce our first speaker. And with us, we have Mr. Daniel Levicher. Daniel is a physicist with a master's degree in management. Daniel Levicher has been gaining experience in the fields of energy and the functioning of electricity systems since 2000. First at the Kershko nuclear power plant. Later, he worked at the European Commission in Luxembourg and at the International Atomic Energy Agency in Vienna. In 2013, as the head of the energy directorate at the Ministry on, of Infrastructure in the Republic of Slovenia, Mr. Levicher and his colleagues drafted a proposal for Slovenia's energy concept aimed at development of a low carbon society. 
since uh, 2019, in fact, August 2019, he serves as a business director of Gain Energia. So, Daniel, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Tomas, for this uh, kind uh, uh, introduction. Uh, thank you, Ifnek, for uh, inviting me to, uh, for, the, for this opportunity to, to, uh, to show you the, the experience with operating a 99% CO2-free generation fleet. Uh, in this next 10 minutes, I will, be, I will take you through a, through a short presentation on uh, practical experience that Gen Energia has with, uh, uh, with the generation fleet of nuclear and and hydro. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? So uh, just in short, what uh, GAIN Group is, we are a, we're a utility company uh, doing business in uh, three core functions that we have. The, our main function being the electricity production. We have a, a, a wide portfolio of uh, generating uh, facilities with the, the main generating facilities in nuclear and, and hydro, and I will go a little bit into the detail uh, later. Then uh, we have a very important part, uh, which is dealing with our future, namely development and investments. We are continually investing in uh, new hydroelectric power plants, and uh, also our main, uh, main development project, this is the new the new nuclear uh, uh, block on the same site where our existing is. Our third pillar uh, in core business function is training and sales. Uh, namely, we, are, uh, we, uh, we own also a trading company and sales companies. So we are in fact, what we are doing, we are, uh, uh, we are transferring our electricity, our uh, production of electricity to our uh, end customers to households and uh, business users. Next slide, please. Uh, our uh, business model is based on uh, vertical integration. Uh, as I explained, uh, production facilities and then uh, to, the, uh, to trading and sales, uh, transmission and distribution in Slovenia is uh, is a regulated business, so this is something that is unbundled under the uh, EU regulation. So we are not dealing with transmission and distribution, but only uh, in production and trading. So these are the uh, where we can uh, reach our uh, our markets and our uh, end customers. Um, next, please. These are basically the numbers uh, uh, to represent the. Uh, that represents the, uh, the business of our, our company. Uh, I wouldn't uh, go much into detail. We employ, maybe this is important, we employ uh, 1,400 uh, employees and we produce yearly around three and a half terawatt hours of, uh, of electricity. Next, please. Uh, now we are getting more into the, uh, into the core business of our uh, of gain, uh, gain group. This is uh, showing uh, uh, this is showing uh, uh, the uh, the portfolio of our production. So 81% of our last year's production of electricity was produced uh, through uh, nuclear power plant. 18% uh, is done by hydro energy, and only 1% uh, through gas. Yes, in fact, is uh, we do uh, we do have in our portfolio also a, a gas uh, powered power plant, uh, but this is mainly to to deal with the ancillary services. So this one percent is uh, dealt with the, the uh, instabilities of the uh, of the of the network. So our gas power plant is uh, in fact is not uh, main uh, mainly is not its main function is not production of electricity, but is uh, uh, to to keep the uh, the stability of the of the grid. Uh, next, please. Uh, just to show you uh, a big picture of uh, where Slovenia stands uh, in uh, in relation to low carbon uh, production, uh, Slovenia uh, with its uh, so uh, Gen Energia and the Gen Group is uh, one of the two main pillars uh, of uh, production in Slovenia. 
so we have two uh, two pillars. Uh, the two thirds of uh, electricity produced in Slovenia uh, is produced from a low carbon uh, uh, low carbon sources. So these are uh, nuclear and and hydro, and one third of the electricity is produced uh, through uh, through uh, carbon. Uh, no, uh, so through uh, lignite power uh, thermal power plant. Next, please. Uh, this is showing you uh, a normal production day in in, uh, in Gain Group. So uh, uh, just to show you how uh, how our production goes uh, th uh, in a day. So uh, we are running our uh, nuclear power plant as a, in a in a base load. Uh, base load mode. Uh, we are owner of a uh, we are 50% owner of uh, of the nuclear power plant stationed in Kershko. It is uh, uh, through a legacy system. 50% is owned uh, by uh, Slovenia, 50% by uh, by Croatia. So what is represented here is 350 megawatts of uh, of power uh, that is owned by uh, Gain Group. Then on top of this, you can see the hydro production. So uh, nuclear in uh, in base load, and then we go into the uh, uh, with with hydro. We are uh, we are doing uh, uh, we are doing a profile, and then in some uh, at some moments, for example, when the, the uh, with in the instability of the grid, when or when the uh, transmission system operator requires additional power, we can uh, we start also with uh, with gas. Uh, with gas turbines in uh, uh, Thermoelectrarna Brestanica, we possess uh, 350 megawatts of uh, of additional power, and this can uh, uh, this uh, thermal uh, power plant is uh, powered by gas, and it uh, it serves as a as a stability point. Uh, there is also uh, we also possess uh, solar, or we have uh, solar power plants in in our in our portfolio, but the uh, it is put on a, on a, on this graph, but it's, uh, the uh, the amount is uh, is uh, at the moment is negligible, but it is there. Uh, next, please. Uh, synergies uh, that we have uh, is uh, tightly related to the uh, to the river where we run most of our uh, of our power plants. So as you can see. Uh, Sava River uh, flows uh, through most of the uh, of the Slovenia, and uh, our uh, production portfolio consists of hydroelectric power plants on uh, on the whole of the uh, of the Sava flow. Uh, the nuclear power plant is also based and stationed on uh, on Sava River, namely, uh, and is uh, its uh, uh, nuclear power plant Kershko is a PWR uh, design. That uses Sava River as a cooling agent for the for its tertiary loop. So uh, the whole the optimization of the whole uh, of the whole uh, uh, production is uh, is very much uh, has to be in line with uh, uh, with the production in uh, hydroelectric power plants. I will go a little bit into detail later. So uh, next slide, please. So the main synergies uh, that uh, we are experiencing uh, in power production and cost optimization across the gain group power plants, we divide them in uh, two separate areas. First of all, we are adjusting production hours relative to electricity price fluctuations. So uh, nuclear power plant is, uh, is therefore, as uh, you, you were able to see in one of, our, of my previous slides in base load mode, so uh, low cost of production uh, makes the case uh, for the MPP to to be uh, to be run in uh, uh, in this uh, base load mode. Although uh, the MPP Kershko was built in a way so that uh, it could also follow uh, go into the load follow mode, but because of the low cost of production and uh, other optimal, uh, it is optimal for uh, operational reasons uh, to run. One minute. Yes. 
Then uh, the, the second one, so the, uh, is the coordinated operation of all units to mitigate uh, high and low river flows, uh, the debris that we can find in the river. So we are managing the operations of uh, operational uh, hydroelectric power plants in a way to avoid, uh, to avoid uh, and postpone the activation of cooling towers in, in the MPP in a way so that uh, we uh, we start the cooling uh, pa uh, cooling towers as uh, as uh, as low or um, as late as possible. In, in this way, uh, we can uh, we can carry the the load or the power of the of the nuclear power plant on the on the level uh, on the maximum level. Next, please. Uh, for future, we have uh, uh, we are. Uh, we are developing a new, uh, a new, uh, a new project, a nuclear power plant Kershko uh, Block Two. Here is just a representation of uh, the two, uh, the two sites that we have uh, on the same site where uh, power plant Kershko is, which is in the middle. Uh, next, please. We are also uh, developing, uh, uh, considering the cogeneration uh, of heat. Uh, so for district heating and industrial uh, steam, uh, this will be uh, this is a project that we are developing together with the with the new block. Next, please. These are the conclusions. Uh, so let's. Uh, it is our vision in uh, Gain Group that the decarbonized electricity is the energy vector of the future. We are. Uh, we are convinced that, uh, and we are going to, and we are basing our business model on this, uh, on this premises, uh, namely a production portfolio of nuclear and renewables, uh, with, uh, we believe is an optimal combination that ensures energy security, decarbonization, and availability uh, of electricity for households and industry competitiveness. Uh, uh, that's uh, that's why we also see the feasibility of nuclear projects. Uh, it depends on uh, inclusive national energy strategies and uh, access to sustainable funds, which we are uh, uh, trying to uh, uh, reach through national strategy and on uh, on the level of EU. And with this, I will uh, conclude my presentation and I will giving back uh, the word to you, Tomasz. Uh, thank you for this insight into business operation of a hybrid system. And uh, with next presentation, we will go from a utility level to national level. And our next speaker will speak about energy transition and the role of nuclear energy. Uh, and uh, this will be Juan Pablo Ordones. Juan Pablo Ordones is a nuclear engineer. He received a nuclear engineering degree in Balseiro Institute and has also a master's degree on science and technology management from the MIT. He worked at INVEP for 40 years, becoming deputy general manager of the company. He is currently the undersecretary of energy planning in the energy secretariat of the Ministry of Productive Development of the Republic of Argentina. He is associate professor at the Balestinero Institute and president of the Alumni Association of the SET Institute. Mr. Ordones, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure and an honor to be able to address you and to tell you something about our plans in, in Argentina for the energy transition. Next slide, please. I, I think it's good if we remember where we are coming from and what we are coming from is uh, from a global climate change. The Earth atmosphere is, uh, temperature is increasing. Next, please. And it is increasing because we are emitting um, green, greenhouse gases and 80% of the effect is due to the carbon dioxide. Next, please. And the carbon dioxide is coming, of course, for energy generation. So from gas, from carbon, and from oil. So we need, during this century, to make a transition for, from our use 
a, a strong, heavy use of uh, carbon uh, energies uh, to no, no to low carbon energies, and it has to happen during this century. Next, please. Um, so most of the problem of climate change is an energy problem, and we have to eventually replace fossil fuels. That's the problem uh, humankind is facing right now. Next, please. Well, this is not the first energy transition the humankind has gone through. So if we look here in the last 200 years, we started with 95% of our genetic coming, energy coming from wood, then around the end of uh, 19th centuries, coal uh, took the place of the principal uh, energy source for, for, for the society. Then around the 50s of the 20th century, oil took that position. Gas is probably taking that position now. So it's not something when we say the energy transition brought fossil fuels and use other kind of fuels, it seems like a very difficult and complex things to do, but uh, humankind has achieved this at least three or four times in the past. So let's move to the next one. And this is the, the energy, so how, how the energy source according to the different countries in, in 2016. And uh, to the left, we have a uh, carbon in, in brown, uh, coal in brown, sorry, uh, gas in light blue, and oil in red. And to the right, we have uh, clean energies, uh, nuclear being yellow, um, blue being hydro, very light blue being renewables, and biofuel and waste being green. So what we call energy transition is actually pushing this border between red and yellow to the left. And we see that different countries are in different places in this, in this energy transition. Some countries like Saudi Arabia, who of course has huge resources of, of oil and gas, generates practically all their energy from uh, fossil fuels. While France in the bottom, and this is similar to the to, to, to some picture Daniel showed previously, while France in the bottom shows generates less than half of their energy from fossil. And of course, the transition has to do with the resources. Countries that have large quantity of fossil resources are a bit behind in this transition to clean energy sources, while countries that have no fossil uh, fuels are far more advanced. Uh, so let us go. So we see Brazil as a second place, in second place, which uh, plenty of biofuel and hydro and some nuclear. And of course, France has a very large uh, quantity of nuclear, a fraction of nuclear energy in, the, in its energy mix. So if you go to the next, please. And we see here the same picture, but in electricity. And we see that the border between clean energies and fossil fuels is, has shifted to the left because in electricity generation, the transition to clean energies is more advanced than in total energy. And this has to do, of course, with transport using most of the transport energy is coming from fuel, fuel, fossil fuels. And, and we see that, for example, France and Brazil are almost there in electricity. And so as part of this transition to clean energies, we will see some more use of, or, 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 or more percentage of end use of energy coming from electricity also. Um, so let's, let's go to the next one, please. And what the, the, the point I will make now is that renewables and nuclear are actually complementary solutions for a clean energy user, a energy future. Next, please. So, of course, we all know that uh, wind varies. So we have this is this shows the variability of uh, a wind turbine generation throughout the year. The next, please. 
This shows the variability of solar energy throughout the year. And the red line in the middle is how can the variability of nuclear power. So nuclear power plants generate constant. So we have here, as Daniel said before, that nuclear and renewables are complementary because uh, one provides base load, the other one provides uh, variable loads. Next, please. So we see here, and, and the, other, the other dimension we need to compare is that the nuclear is a very, very concentrating power source, while uh, renewables are very dispersed. Uh, nuclear requires very small quantity of, of, of land, while uh, solar, hydro, and, and wind requires very large quantities, hundreds of times the quantity of land that requires nuclear. So they are completely complementary. In Argentina, we have another also, uh, another future also, please, the next one. And we see, this is a map of Argentina, and we see that wind is concentrated in the southern part of the country, Patagonia, where I'm here now with a foot of snow in the streets. And while um, solar is concentrated in the northern part of the country. Uh, and the next one, please. While the demand is concentrated around the center part of the country. So we have the sources of energy far from the demand for energy. And that's what nuclear can solve because you can place nuclear power plants close to the demand in the middle part of the country. The next one, please. What type of nuclear power plants we have in Argentina? We have three nuclear power plants, all uh, placed in the center part of the country, two of them very close to Buenos Aires, and we are placing the third one now, which will be called Atucha Free, which is just 100 kilometers away from Buenos Aires a city. And in Buenos Aires city is concentrated back almost 40% of the electricity demand in Argentina is concentrated around uh, Buenos Aires city and, and the, the surroundings. So we have a, up to now three uh, heavy water moderated reactors. And the fourth one would be a PWR, uh, most probably from a wall on one type from China. And the next one, please. One minute. Yes. The next one, please, uh, is, is that uh, this is uh, our local design. We are developing in Argentina an SMR called Karen Reactor, uh, which is uh, under construction and will be finished uh, in three years. This is the first prototype. It's a very small nuclear power plant of 32 megawatts. And our plan is to develop that to a uh, uh, mo a module of uh, between 100 and 200 megawatts, and that in the future, thus, thus in the future, our main source of energy would be small and medium of nuclear energy would be small and medium medium reactor of the current design. Uh, next, please. So I I'm only left to thank you for your attention and. I'm ready for questions after the other uh, presenters. Thank you again. Thank you, Mr. Odones. Uh, it was very informative and on time. Uh, so this, we have seen two, two examples of national system or uh, utility system. And now we would like to see a little bit into the future with demonstrating demonstration projects. And our next speaker will be Ms. Shannon Breck Seaton. Uh, Brex Eaton is the lead for the Integrated Energy Systems in the Nuclear Science and Technology Directorate at Idaho National Laboratory. Uh, she is also within INL the lead for DOE Applied Energy Tree Laboratory Consortium. So this is the consortium which includes Idaho National Labs, the National Renewable Energy Lab and the National Energy Technology Lab. So she is really in a good position to talk about integration and to explain also a little bit about NICE. Uh, since 2010, when she joined INL, she worked on different areas from space nuclear power and propulsion systems to advanced nuclear fuel development. 
and currently she serves as National Technical Director for the DOE Nuclear Energy Integrated Energy Systems. Shannon holds a PhD and Master degree in Nuclear Engineering from the University of Michigan and Master in Medical Physics from the University of Texas at Houston and Bachelor of Science in Nuclear Engineering from Texas and m University. Shannon, this is my short introduction of you and please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for that introduction and thank you to the, for the previous talks who really established a great foundation as to the transitions that we are in for our energy systems and how the increasing uh, penetrations of renewable energy, which increases variability on the grid, is changing the landscape and really offering us new opportunities for how we can utilize traditionally base load systems to support more energy needs across different energy sectors. So today I want to just give you a brief introduction to some of the work that we have done to model these types of systems and where that's going with some near-term projects on demonstration of hydrogen production at uh, nuclear plants. Next slide, please. So when we think about designing these future energy systems, we of course want to use our energy effectively and efficiently. And we really think about maximizing the use of that capital investment that has gone into putting these energy systems in place. But first we need to understand the goals that we're trying to achieve with our energy systems before we select technologies. Uh, I think we can in general agree that these systems should be reliable, resilient, affordable, Provide, provide sustainability and also reduce the emissions that we see from our energy sectors. We also then need to think about how that energy will be used. Is it purely to meet electric demands on the grid? Or do we also need to think about other energy use sectors such as uh, heat and steam needs in the industrial applications? Is it located in a region that needs water purification or a region that that has, has many different industries uh, that are developing new chemical processes that can utilize this energy differently. And finally, the focus on hydrogen production that I'll go into later in these slides, and hydrogen as a, an energy carrier that can go to support many different applications, ranging from uh, delayed electricity production, production of transportation fuels that can reduce emissions relative to our current approaches, as well as industrial applications. So after we understand that landscape, we then can begin talking about the roles for each energy source in either coordinated energy systems or tightly integrated energy systems that leverage all of the assets that might be provided by multiple generators, such as nuclear, renewables, wind, solar, hydro, or even fossil fuels with carbon capture and sequestration. And when we think about the nuclear technologies, this webinar series has really laid a great foundation for understanding how nuclear energy can be right-sized to the application. And as we see the advent of small modular reactors, we can begin to see how nuclear technology can support energy needs of various community sizes or energy demands. We even see an advent of what we refer to as micro-reactors that are on the megawatt scale and can do even more to support energy needs in remote communities, um, isolated applications, microgrids, et cetera. And of course, advanced reactors, many of which operate at higher temperatures than our current fleet and can do a better job even of supporting some of these applications around the circle on the right. Next slide, please. So as we look at different energy system options, uh, we need to take into consideration the resources available in a particular region, the technologies that are available to us, the economic platform that these need to operate within the energy markets, as well as the cost to implement each of these systems. And then we need to apply a, a look at the market potential for these different energy products. So INL, in collaboration with our other national laboratories, has developed a graded approach to identify design options and then evaluate uh, these different hybrid system architectures, moving from steady state process modeling to assess initial feasibility, moving then into dynamic modeling, making sure that these systems do work under dynamic conditions as we shift energy flows from electricity production to production of alternative commodities such as hydrogen. And then we wrap that with a system optimization approach where we characterize the physical performance or technical performance of these integrated energy systems, 
and wrap that with an economic analysis in order to design the system configuration, uh, including component sizes, and also to optimally dispatch that energy in real time as a function of grid demand, uh, wind speed, solar irradiation, et cetera. Uh, next slide, please. So I'd like to now introduce an example. Uh, I'm only focusing on hydrogen today. That's not the only application we're looking at. It is highly regionally dependent what applications make the most sense. Uh, but let's focus in on hydrogen to understand why we want to use nuclear energy and other generators to support multiple processes beyond electricity. Uh, if we go to production of a commodity such as hydrogen, we can provide an additional avenue for energy storage, which can defer electricity production to a time that it is needed, or it can go to support many other applications and thereby introducing low emission technologies across many energy use sectors. Uh, so we look at the production of chemicals and fuel synthesis, steel manufacturing, production of ammonia-based fertilizers. The traditional means for producing hydrogen is steam methane reforming or breaking down of natural gas which is highly emitting. So introducing nuclear and renewables to this process reduces the emissions associated with hydrogen. This provides a second source of revenue to the generator, such as a nuclear system that's traditionally operating at base load. Currently, we see flexible operations of those generators in regions with high renewable penetration, meaning less electricity produced and less income to that generator. So by having hydrogen produced, we now have a second source of revenue to ensure that that plant maintains economic viability. We also provide an opportunity for a nuclear system to provide more grid services, including reserves and grid regulation. So if we look at this diagram, we can see ways in which we can couple these systems thermally to provide thermal uh, energy directly to the coupled applications, such as high temperature electrolysis, or we might take electrical energy prior to the grid interconnect uh, to ensure that we meet the needs of that coupled process while also meeting the, the electrical demand on the grid. Now, I will be focused on some demonstrations that we are working on in collaboration with industry, current fleet light water reactors to produce hydrogen, but I want to make the point that this provides a very strong foundation for how we might do this with future small modular reactors and advanced reactors laying a foundation for the technical understanding of these systems, the economic associated with operating a system in this way, and of course the regulatory structure associated with this. Next slide, please. So just a quick snapshot here of some recently completed analyses. We've done a number of case studies using these tools in collaboration, as I said, with our other national laboratory partners and across multiple programs in the Department of Energy to assess the production of alternative commodities using light water reactors. Uh, here I focus on two studies that were conducted for hydrogen production. We've also looked at water purification and some other applications as well. Uh, both of these projects focus on plants in the Midwest region of the United States. And we look at the production technology, whether that be high temperature or low temperature electrolysis, the offtake for that hydrogen, where is it going? What industries is it supporting? And how can we ensure that this becomes economically viable? So the plot on the right is just a quick snapshot of what some of those economic analyses show looking at different technologies for hydrogen production. And SMR on the left is actually steam methane reforming here for hydrogen production. Low temperature electrolysis in the middle and high temperature electrolysis in the right. And you see that we can look at different variables for the price of electricity in a region price of natural gas, et cetera, to understand the economic viability. So I encourage you to go take a look at those reports to better understand some of the analyses that we have done. For now, I'll go to the next slide and focus on where we're going with these analyses now. The results of those studies showed sufficient economic uh, viability and technical viability to move forward with demonstration. So this first project is led by Exxon, which is uh, the company in the US that owns and operates the most nuclear plants in partnership with a laboratory consortium and Nell Hydrogen for the production of the electrolysis cells. Both this and the next project that I'll highlight will demonstrate the hydrogen production uh, using direct electrical uh, interconnection with the LWR plant. Uh, this will be behind the grid interconnect, and this will allow the plant operators to become familiar with the methods and controls 
that will be needed for scaling up to larger hydrogen production facilities and in the future thermally interconnected hydrogen production. Uh, they'll begin to understand the power offtake dynamics and how that system can respond differently to, to grid demand. This plant and the other plant where these demonstrations will be uh, implemented first operate within different uh, energy markets. Uh, they're fairly close uh, geographically, but they operate within different markets in the U.S. One minute. I will look at uh, the hydrogen production uh, for captive use by those nuclear plants or by nearby uh, hydrogen uh, use facilities. So if we go to the next slide, you'll see that the second um, demonstration will be at the davis Bessey plant in Ohio in the, again, the Midwest region of the U.S., this is actually a consortium of uh, industry partners, including Energy Harbor, which owns and operates Davis Bessey, Excel Energy, and Arizona Public Service. Uh, this is phase one of a study where we will look at uh, electrical interconnection for hydrogen production on site at the Davis Bessey plant as shown here. And then subsequent phases would look at demonstration using different technologies at the other partner facilities. Uh, in both of these projects, the engineering design team focuses on design and location of the hydrogen equipment such that the effect on the design and licensing basis is mitigated. And uh, this will again lay that foundation for regulatory approval of these types of facilities. Uh, between the two projects, we will see some hardware on the ground within the next year and a half to two years. Um, so we're, we're really looking forward to that. Uh, next slide, please. On this last slide, I just want to say a few more words about the NICE Future initiative that Susie introduced at the beginning of this. Uh, we really want to ensure working across uh, the countries engaged in the clean energy ministerial, which includes 25 countries and the European Commission, uh, that nuclear energy is considered among other clean energy technologies and exploring diverse energy solutions. Uh, we recognize nuclear energy may not be the right solution for all of these countries, uh, but that it needs to be considered in the evolution of opportunities that nuclear provides are also considered. Uh, so we do have uh, eight participant countries that have joined the lead countries in uh, this activity, and these in, the lead countries being Canada, Japan, and the U.S., and a number of international uh, external partners, including IFNEC. Uh, the fo focus areas for NICE Future are shown here, really going from the technology associated with integrated systems that we've been discussing, the economics and market structures, uh, as well as engagement of policymakers and stakeholders and communications on the, new, the role of nuclear energy. So I encourage you to take a look at what NICE Future has to offer, join some of our webinars. We've had uh, a couple of publications come out and one on nuclear flexibility that will be put out in September. And on my last slide, I just want to encourage you to be creative, to think about what clean energy systems might look like for your country and how nuclear technology might be a part of that system overall. So thank you for your time and I'll turn it back to you, Tomasz. Thank you for this uh, vision of interesting clean energy systems around the globe. So expanding from small countries to big countries, everybody can be clean energy system. And with that, we will go to uh, another region of the world. This is, we're going to Europe and we will hear from uh, European Research Institute. Our next speaker will be uh, Kamil Tuchek. Kamil Tuchek is a researcher and team leader at the European Commission Joint Research Center in Peten. He received his PhD in physics from Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm and his master in nuclear engineering from Czech Technical University in Prague. His scientific background includes advanced reactor systems, relevant uh, related material compatibility and safety assessment as well as energy system integration in evolving markets and uh, Camille will talk about European research and in initiatives in the relevant field for hybrid systems including cogeneration. Camille the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Tomasz. Thank you for this uh, very kind introduction. And uh, thank you also for the invitation to contribute to the IFNEC uh, SMR webinar series. And indeed, I'm happy to present the uh, European research and initiatives on uh, hybrid energy systems, uh, including uh, cogeneration. On the next slide, uh, I would like to start discussing the context of the nuclear energy in Europe. 
Uh, there are 108 uh, nuclear reactors uh, which are in operation in uh, 13 EU member states. Uh, nuclear energy provides about 25% uh, of EU gross electricity generation, around 50% uh, of EU low carbon electricity generation and uh, supports uh, around 1 million of jobs. In EU, each member state can uh, decide on the inclusion of the nuclear power in its uh, energy mix. Uh, currently, there are four new reactors uh, which are under construction in France, uh, Finland and Slovakia and uh, about uh, 20 reactors are in uh, different stages of planning and uh, preparation in eight uh, member states. Uh, in Europe, in terms of the climate and energy policy goals presented on the next slide, uh, the uh, uh, objective is to achieve uh, climate uh, neutrality by 2050 under which uh, significant energy efficiencies are envisaged. Uh, also, the share of renewables is expected to grow uh, dramatically to about 60% uh, of the gross uh, in one consumption. And uh, the renewables are then expected to be complemented uh, mostly with uh, nuclear sources, having about uh, 10 to 20% of the share. Uh, the nuclear sources will be a combination of uh, long-term operation and new build and indeed uh, the latter needs to happen rather soon to keep up its uh, retirement of the existing uh, nuclear plants. On the next slide it's illustrated that uh, the European climate and energy strategy also aims at integration of different uh, energy vectors, uh, power, gas and heat. Uh, this indeed in support to the decarbonization of not only of the electricity sector, but also industrial transport and uh, agriculture sectors. Now, we, if we look at the next slide, in Europe, uh, the uh, European Strategic Energy Technology Plan, uh, set plan is an uh, instrument uh, driving the implementation of the European Energy Union. It identifies uh, 10 uh, key actions in support to the objective to reduce the cost of key technologies uh, to enhance the security of supply, to improve the energy efficiency, as well as to improve the energy system resilience. As a key element of the plan, uh, uh, this also includes a further development of uh, renewable technologies and uh, their integration with other technologies, which indeed also includes the nuclear. Next, please. Now, with our rising uh, proportions of uh, uh, variable renewables and uh, improved optimization of the integration of uh, nuclear renewables is, uh, as uh, previous speakers have already highlighted, uh, further opportune uh, through cogeneration, but also possibly through establishment of a tighter coupling uh, via nuclear renewable hybrid energy systems. Uh, the nuclear cogenerations uh, allow switching between uh, electricity and heat generation, uh, with uh, nuclear power plants still being able to operate at a uh, high capacity. Uh, at the same time, uh, variable renewables uh, integrated in the hybrid energy system can be less curtailed and the surplus of the energy can be used to deliver uh, new carbon wind products or services, as uh, for example, industrial process heat, uh, hydrogen, uh, hydrocarbons or uh, district heating service. Uh, such systems can uh, work well in uh, the localized markets and can also support other policy objectives, including uh, improved uh, nuclear waste management through transportation. Uh, our next slide presents that uh, uh, cogeneration is already an established industry. In fact, uh, uh, with uh, 750 reactor years of operating experience. Uh, in the current applications, uh, uh, steam extracted from uh, light water reactors is used at uh, numerous sites in uh, pulp and uh, paper industry uh, for district heating as well as for water desalination. Next, please. In the EU, as uh, one of the energy and climate policy objectives, uh, the member states uh, shall endeavor to increase the share of renewables in the heating and cooling sector by 13% over a 10 year period from 2021 uh, to 2030 uh, compared to situation in 2020. In this context, uh, interesting accounting also for waste heat, uh, irrespective of origin, including uh, then also nuclear, uh, in these targets is possible up to a maximum of 40% of uh, average annual increase. 
So if we consider a European scenario, uh, these figures include uh, also UK, about 28 uh, megatoes, uh, meaning 325 uh, terawatt hours of waste heat can be credited in these corresponding targets. And uh, similar crediting for waste heat also uh, uh, is uh, possible in the district heating and uh, cooling sector. On the next slide, um, in Europe, uh, sustainable uh, nuclear energy and technology platform uh, is a um, stakeholder platform which implements the set plan nuclear action. And under the umbrella of the SNDTP, one of its pillars, a nuclear continuation industrial initiative, NCTI, develops new applications of nuclear power based on a cogeneration of electricity, heat, and uh, production of uh, new carbon wind energy products. In this context, the NC2I uh, also investigates further tighter integration of uh, nuclear and renewables in the form of uh, hybrid energy systems. And on the next slide, uh, we are giving you an example of a flexible nuclear 165 megawatt thermal steam producing uh, HTGR a boiler, which is uh, being developed by the NC2I uh, with the objectives to replace aging uh, standard coal or gas boilers. Uh, there is, a, in fact, a large market in the EU for a process heat uh, with temperatures at around uh, 550 degrees C, uh, which amounts to more than uh, 80 gigawatts. So uh, um, we may imagine that uh, to meet the entire uh, EU market needs, the integration uh, with uh, renewables in this uh, nuclear renewable uh, hybrid energy systems uh, would be very opportune and are very favorable, and of course, not only in this market segment, but also in the others. The high temperature reactor, which is considered uh, here, can be plugged into existing industrial steam grid uh, using uh, existing infrastructure. And uh, another important feature here is uh, full passive safety. On the next slide, uh, I'm giving you an example of uh, benefits uh, which uh, could be expected from deploying hybrid energy system in a fertilizer production. Uh, this is a very in intensive uh, strategically important commodity, uh, which is currently highly dependent on natural gas, uh, both as an energy source and as a feedstock. Uh, emissions from ammonia productions are currently around two tons uh, CO2 per ton of ammonia. So if only the heat for the Haber-Bosch reaction could be delivered from a hybrid uh, uh, energy system instead of burning of natural gas, approximately eight megatons of CO2 could be annually saved in the EU, as well as, of course, concomitant uh, natural gas imports. Next, please. Apart from uh, the high temperature reactors, uh, which we discussed uh, uh, a minute ago, the other concepts are being developed, uh, which are SMRs based on the uh, light water reactor technology. Uh, many of these uh, LWR SMRs consider novel features, including the integration of primary components, such as steam generators in the reactor pressure vessel, and uh, the use of, uh, the use of uh, passive natural convection cool and flow. Uh, one example of this development is design of SMR concept uh, developed by the Consortium of Partners in Europe, led by France, and investigated in the, within the European project ELSMO. In the frame of generation four, the reactor concepts uh, with further improved safety and uh, performance characteristics are being developed. Uh, this includes uh, very high temperature reactors, uh, liquid metal cooled reactors, sodium lead cooled reactors, as well as uh, molten salt reactors, which are considered uh, as an option. One minute, I mean. And uh, you need while recognizing that uh, numerous uh, cogeneration options uh, can be deployed already nowadays, uh, let us discuss further R&D needs for more advanced applications on the next slide. I think that uh, we could classify these into four overarching domains uh, related to innovative technologies, innovative materials, uh, deployment aspects, as well as societal policy and uh, regulatory aspects. Our, uh, in our mind, uh, further innovations encompass uh, development and qualification of the inherent uh, passive safety features uh, for the justification of the reduction of emergency preparedness zone, as well as development and integration of the dedicated components and uh, their prototyping. Uh, moreover, the development of the innovative accident learn fuels and more resilient materials would uh, further improve uh, performance and safety characteristics. 
And also in this context, the key needs are cost reductions, possibly more streamlined licensing process, uh, streamlined supply chain, and improved uh, standardization and harmonization. And of course, public acceptance and uh, sufficient funding are also fundamental. So uh, with this, I would like to thank you very much for your kind attention and uh, invite you to work together and in cooperation on related technology developments, as well as uh, robust and understandable scenario studies, uh, which would deliver convincing strategy for a uh, wider deployment of both uh, co-generation and uh, a nuclear renewable integration through hybrid energy systems. So thank you again. I'm looking forward indeed to responding to any comments or questions. Over to you, Tomasz. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I mean, some questions are already also for you on the question and answers uh, panel, and maybe we will discuss some also in, in, in the panel in the end, because some are also probably interesting for the rest of the panel. But thank you also for this presentation and introducing the question, what are the needs for future reactors, which is a perfect question for our next speaker, uh, who will speak about the role of the advanced reactor systems and how to meet the future market needs. Our speaker will be Aiden Pickman. Aiden is technical lead at the National Nuclear Laboratory in UK in computational modeling of reactor systems and their applications, including flexible power operation, fuel cycle performance, and non-electric applications. His expertise in conventional reactors also includes support for the operation of the UK reactor fleet, fuel design for European reactor systems, and multi-physics high performance computing. Aiden is the UK representative and chair of the OECD NEA Advanced Reactors and Future Energy Market Needs Study. And in fact, we will also hear the results of this study right now. So Aiden, the floor is yours. Thank you, Thomas, for that very kind introduction. Um, so as Thomas mentions, I've been uh, very kindly asked to provide um, some thoughts uh, and comments from the um, NEA Expert Group on Advanced Reactor Systems and Future Energy Market Needs, which has a very catchy acronym of RFM. Um, I didn't pick that. So if we can go to the next slide, please, if that's okay. Thank you very much. Um, so it's probably important to note that in this uh, piece of work, um, advanced reactors relates to uh, evolutions of generation three and three plus uh, systems, uh, small modular like water reactors, uh, gen four systems that, that CAMEL and some of the other um, presenters have very, very nicely introduced, uh, and small modular variants of generation four systems. Um, we're hoping, envisaging publication of the output from the advanced reactor systems and future energy market needs um, work around the middle of next uh, next year. Uh, so there's some error bars in that, hopefully sooner, might be a little bit later. Um, and the aim is to analyze to what extent advanced reactors and development today can help address those future market needs. So if we can go to the next slide, please, if that's okay. So it's, it's probably it's worth mentioning that um, a significant portion of existing local carbon energy uh, electricity demand is met by nuclear power, uh, nuclear power plants. Around a third of low carbon electricity globally is met by uh, nuclear power. Um, many countries, as part of their de decarbonisation efforts, uh, expect electricity demand to double from uh, the, the, the current demand rate in the future if they're, if they're to meet their uh, their climate targets. Um, so. Many nuclear reactors operate at fairly high capacity uh, factors and, and generate uh, solely electricity. Um, in some countries, particularly uh, those with a, a large reliance on uh, nu nuclear power plants, um, they do undergo uh, operational flexibility, so low following profile operation. I'll discuss those a little bit more later on. Uh, and it's worth noting that whilst most nuclear power plants generate uh, electricity, uh, there has been some past experience with operating nuclear plants for desalination uh, and also uh, around a dozen reactors for, for district heat applications. If we can go to the next slide, please. So it's, it's worth noting, so obviously as part of this, this um, NEA uh, study, it's, it's worth, there's an element of the future, but it's also worth noting that there's already a lot of, a lot of change going, going on uh, in, 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 in the global energy landscape. So uh, we're seeing an increasing role uh, of electricity. Um, there's been uh, a large effort, a very effective effort to, to in increase the adoption of electric vehicles. And that is, that is uh, increased significantly over the last 10 years. Um, also, many countries are hoping to um, electrify. Uh, one of their aims to decarbonize heat demand is via uh, electrification of heating. And also many countries are 
um, uh, as, as their economies grow, they're seeing increasing uh, demand for, for cooling. Um, on uh, the, the adoption of, of uh, electric, electric vehicles creates um, a, a nice opportunity for uh, demand side management. Uh, that's what, one of the options there. Um, so with electric vehicles, you can, one option is to simply very carefully timing when electric vehicles undergo charging. Um, and that, that alone is one significant element of, of demand side uh, management. So you can help uh, minimize demand fluctuations uh, over the day. Um, we, we see that in UK and and, 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 and uh, US studies where if you look into the future, if there is a lot of adoption of electric vehicles, that, that can help with minimizing fluctuations. Um, other, other elements as well are storage. So uh, for, for those countries, uh, particularly depending on their climate, the heat demand can fluctuate quite a lot over a period of a few days. So having storage options to, 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 to accommodate that uh, will be important. And also um, hand in hand with demand side management, um, there's also the option if you have a large scale adoption of electric vehicles to use their batteries as a storage mechanism. And also there's uh, an aim to decarbonize sectors that are less amenable to employing low carbon electricity. So that can include uh, industrial process, industrial process uh, heat demands uh, and also heating in, in general. So residential, commercial, and that can be via uh, district heating, which uh, nuclear plants uh, uh, can provide. Uh, and also potentially the production of, of hydrogen um, to, to help decarbonize heating, uh, and that could be residential and commercial. Uh, next slide, please, if that's okay. So we see that, um, I mean, it's worth noting that there's, there's a lot of uncertainty in the future, and depending on how uh, the, the future uh, evolves, that will have an impact on, on how nuclear plants um, will be de deployed and, 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 and used. So um, we see that with a large deployment of variable new energy sources, um, you'll have uh, great reliance on uh, load following um, and, and profile operation uh, from, from plants. So profile operation is where a f normally a, a number of days in advance the, the, the plant operators are, uh, are given a prescribed uh, power production profile to follow. Uh, that can help the operators ensure that supply and demand meet. Um, load following is generally a shorter term nature where there needs to be significant change in, in output. Um, we also see with large scale variable new energy source uh, deployment um, that there's an increasing reliance on, on, on frequency response which nuclear plants can provide uh, and also inertia is a, is a really important attribute um, when, when, when uh, looking at a, a grid behavior and stability. So conventional power plants like nuclear and low carbon uh, alter, um, options as well, uh, more, conven uh, more conventional um, plants rather than gas and coal but CCS and uh, biomass. Um, they have very large, uh, dense turbines, and therefore when uh, the, the plant trips, they don't stop immediately generating power, uh, it coasts down. Um, and that, that attribute is really important, uh, along with frequency response, to ensure stability. Uh, and we see that nuclear power plants with their, with their large, um, heavy turbines can provide that. Um, and if, however, if there, is, if there is a large deployment uh, of, of technologies that can support storage and demand side management, uh, then there's generally less reliance on, on node following operation. Um, and it enables the, the nuclear plants to operate at uh, high capacity uh, factors uh, when looking at future scenarios. But again, it's just the uncertainty around um, how, how, how the future is going to develop. Um, one of the attributes of many of the advanced react systems, uh, particularly the, the fast reactors, there's the, the option to close the, the fuel cycle. So whilst we, um, it's difficult to envisage in the short to medium term a, a strong economic driver to, to, to close uh, the, the fuel cycle, um, you see you from strategically uh, in fuel security uh, and reducing the waste burden, then there's, there's an attribute there of advanced reactors, particularly the, the, the many of the Gen 4 systems that can, can help uh, with spent fuel management. Um, we, before I discussed um, operational flexibility and product flexibility, uh, another important attribute to consider as well is, is deployment flexibility. And that's something that many of the advanced systems and the small modular reactors um, are designed to help improve. So by scalability, siting, con constructability, um, if you want to uh, deploy them in, in, in slightly more novel settings, uh, a greater rate, say for district heating or to provide industrial uh, heat directly or um, off-grid applications, then deployment flexibility becomes um, an important attribute. And that's something that the, 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 the advanced reactors um, are potentially more amenable to address. If we can go to the next slide, please. Um, 
So on, on the heat application side, um, I've already discussed before desalination, district heating. Uh, this could become significant, uh, as, as many of the coll my colleagues have already mentioned. Um, electricity is only a, a, it's a significant but a small portion of, of total energy demand. Um, and there may be, in, in the future, if we are, are to achieve our, our, our climate targets, there will be a, a need for, for um, decarbonisation of heating um, at a significant scale. Also, uh, in industrial heat demand, it's worth noting that based on European data, around 60% of industrial uh, heat demand is, is below 550 degrees Celsius. So many of the react systems can, uh, advanced react systems can, can address that also, well, for the demand, around 30% of demand below 300 degrees Celsius, for which uh, light water reactors uh, and more conventional nuclear plants uh, can readily, readily meet. Um, for uh, due to some of the challenges in decarbonizing certain sectors, hydrogen is, is one option to help uh, uh, decarbonize uh, those, those sectors. So hydrogen could be used for residential commercial heating, it could be used for storage uh, as, a, as a means of energy storage. It can also be used, as Shannon mentioned, as a, as a chemical feedstock for certain um, industrial processes. Um, and uh, one option uh, is to, to use high temperature heat from certain advanced reactors, um, say using the thermochemical cycle, so hydrogen sulfide cy cycle, uh, to um, produce produce hydrogen in that manner, and that would create a significant amount of, of, of heat demand, low carbon heat demand between 500 and 1,000 degrees Celsius. So that's also worth considering. And again, it just kind of feeds into the fact that the future is uncertain, and depending on on, on how uh, certain sections and areas uh, grow, um, then that will impact how uh, nuclear will be deployed in the future. Um, and I think uh, I talk very quickly, and I think um, that just leads me to. That's, that was my last comment. So thank you for your attention and I'll hand back to Thomas. Thank you. Thank you, Adam, for this uh, contribution. So what we have learned is that, as far as I got, is that markets will need large and small reactors and markets will create a complex systems. And this will then also went to our next uh, speaker uh, who will talk about how to implement resilient complex systems with renewables and hybrid systems. So our next uh, speaker will be uh, Hosam Gabar. Hosam is a full professor in the University of, uh, in the Ontario Technical University. Uh, and within the Ontario Technical University, he's at the Faculty for Energy Systems and Nuclear Science. He's leading national and international research experts in the area of smart energy grids, energy, energy safety and control system, nuclear renewable hybrid energy systems, and ways to energy using advanced plasma technologies. Dr. Gabor obtained his BSc Bachelor of Science degree in, in 1988 uh, with first class of honor from the Faculty of Engineering in Alexandria University in Egypt. And in 2001, he obtained his PhD degree from Okayama University in Japan. Awesome, I think this is uh, your cue to start. Thank you very much, um, and I'm delighted to be with you. It is a great opportunity to discuss uh, uh, the future for implementation strategies and plans for nuclear renewable uh, hybrid energy systems. Uh, next, please. So I will be discussing uh, mainly uh, some uh, strategies and uh, possible implementations uh, and um, uh, also how to make it uh, successful in a way that uh, to meet your user requirements and meet the uh, target performance measures uh, in view of current technologies and the local uh, demand and the local technology availability. Next. So the first, uh, first uh, picture I'd like to share with you is um, to show that, uh, as you see here, we have three possible uh, uh, means for energy connectivity. One is through electric power, which is uh, the salt line, and the thermal power, and the hydrogen uh, uh, lines. As you see that the connectivity from the left side, we are able to connect the nuclear reactor as a means for uh, power, electric power connection. That can feed to the electric load directly. And um, as you see, we have also uh, the biomass power, uh, thermal load. And uh, in the middle, we have the uh, E2H, which is uh, electric to heat, as well as the flywheel, which is uh, large scale on energy storage, electric storage, which is quite the high energy density and power density. Uh, in addition, we can have the, the left side, we have the typical renewable, uh, including the wind, solar, and uh, uh, connected to the load. 
the key point which you would like to say here is the strategy can be successful based on the demand profile and the, the demand uh, uh, represented in the electric load and the thermal load as well as the hydrogen demand as well and the mix between them. Uh, this is one of the strategies that can be uh, uh, implemented based on set of performance indicators and based on performance measures. Those performance measures on the level of the electric line, uh, the electric uh, network, the thermal network and the hydrogen. In addition, which is not available here actually, that we are able to connect these two transportation infrastructures as well with a, with a high need for uh, transportation electrifications, we do need the uh, high uh, uh, availability and also reliability of electric uh, supply. And that uh, requires uh, um, uh, us to have a reliable and resilient energy network. And uh, um, this is one of the applications. Uh, next, please. Uh, in this picture, we are talking about different strategy. And the strategy here, as you see, is that from the nuclear reactor, we are able to get two uh, uh, inputs, which is the electric line goes to the electric network and the thermal line goes to the thermal network. And from the thermal network, we can take it to different applications, including biomass, including um, uh, thermal load, uh, including uh, maybe uh, some other applications uh, that can be uh, including chemical uh, processes and other even hydrogen production. Uh, in the electric side, uh, we are able to connect these two number of uh, applications, including, of course, uh, the fuel cell, the flywheel energy storage and electrolyzer, and uh, heat to uh, electricity. Uh, the, the implementation strategies here uh, can be successful based on uh, performance measures, and uh, we actually implemented this with number of uh, models uh, and simulation scenarios based on uh, performance criteria. So for instance, if you are looking to reduce op uh, operational cost, that uh, we can put high weight on the operational cost. If your target is to maintain uh, resiliency or availability, we are able to maintain that uh, in the modeling part to achieve the target uh, requirements. If your target is environmental uh, protection and less carbon emission, so that is one of the performance measures that we are able to uh, achieve. So uh, we are able to actually model number of, uh, of scenarios and the configurations based on the target performance criteria that we'd like to achieve. Next, please. Uh, in this picture, we have here multiple resources and multiple products. And uh, here we are expanding the network. Um, and uh, as you see, we are able to get from the nuclear or again, the electric and thermal uh, with biomass, thermal storage and thermal load. So we are able to integrate uh, this in two ways and also for the electric load. Um, the, the idea here is uh, in, in the flexibility of this model is that we are able to design the, this network based on site so we are able to size the, the wind farm, we are able to size the PV, we are able to size and optimize the sizing of energy storage represented as flywheel, which is energy electric energy storage, but also thermal storage, as well as the fuel storage, uh, such as the electrolyzer and tank. Uh, so we are able to optimize the sizing, we are able to optimize the control strategy, which, is, uh, which can be configured in the control uh, parameters of this uh, network to allow us to achieve the target performance measures. I would like to take you to some applications. So next, please. So uh, we will see some applications. And this is was actually discussed in some of, uh, as you know, Ontario is, uh, we, we are really high, high use of nuclear power in our electricity grid. We are reaching 60% in some stages. Uh, and the, to the uh, like full dependency and the high dependency on nuclear power, we we are very uh, like consider nuclear operators and uh, nuclear power plants are very careful about the outage. And one of the applications that was discussed what to do in in, in case of outage, and uh, uh, we studied with them number of scenarios, and this was one of the uh, design scenario that we uh, discussed. Uh, for instance, a normal operation, what to do in emergency operation, what to do in, in outage what to do and uh, this was uh, discussed in view of 
integrating micro modular reactor or small modular reactor as connected to the transition uh, transmission line and that will be connected to the nuclear power plant uh, in normal operation and, 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 and in outage um, in addition actually we have extended this for transportation electrification so we are able to expand the, the charging station for transportation infrastructures as connected to uh, the nuclear uh, stations as well to maximize the uh, capital uh, and uh, the profit and uh, based on the capital cost. Uh, next, please. So uh, this is another application where uh, we are we see here the safety part of it. So um, as you know, nuclear power plant uh, should be operated uh, uh, all the time in in a safe mode where we have uh, classified. The, the, the electric uh, lines into uh, four uh, classes and that is uh, uh, where we are able to identify the highest uh, important and um, uh, um, priority uh, power systems in the nuclear power plant that should be running all the time. Uh, most of the nuclear power plants use uh, these generators uh, uh, as a backup uh, means for class 3 for instance. What we are offering here is integrated uh, a flywheel which is energy storage to achieve that hybrid uh, nuclear with energy storage that is uh, reflected into a, a like safer uh, plant operation during emergencies. Next please. Um, and this is for, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we in Canada we have one. Of, I mean, worldwide we do have uh, uh, national and international projects for transportation electrification, in particular for fast charging, uh, with the need to have uh, high uh, uh, or fast uh, charging capabilities. That requires availability of. Uh, nuclear power in small scale and medium scale and that's why this is one of the designs that we are pre representing and presenting to our market needs in Canada where we are integrating the small modular reactor to uh, uh, fast charging station uh, based on uh, flywheel and the uh, super capacitor ultra capacitor technologies and that will allow us to achieve uh, um, like we again we model that as a fast charging station and based on the transportation demand and the electricity demand of the from the grid to, uh, to be able to get a balance between both and to achieve the highest performance from the charging point of view and from the grid point of view next please one one minute okay. sure next please uh, the last application is actually uh, this is uh, we had been uh, this, uh, studying possible uh, application in marine ships uh, with integrated microgrid. One of the areas that we have been discussing is uh, <clears throat> the impact on temperature, in particular for hybrid battery and energy storage systems that has some limitations and the challenges in very cold weather or very hot weather. So this is one of the applications to understand where the ships will be moving around the world. And the uh, next piece, and based on that, we started designing um, like possible application within the marine. So uh, next piece. Yes, so uh, this uh, picture shows that this is possible implementation for marine ships uh, using SMR. And the next slide will show the actual uh, block diagram to be represented within uh, the marine, including, of course, uh, wind, solar, and uh, SMR integration based on heat exchanger and chiller, uh, as well as uh, heating cooling sides of, of, the, of the network. So uh, I just showed, thought to share with you some of those applications. And the key point is really modeling of uh, key performance indicators through uh, uh, different stages of, of the design and operational. And that will be reflected to the control strategy. Um, next, please. So uh, uh, with this, uh, next, please. Yeah. With this, I would like to thank you. And uh, I would say, uh, just for the sake of, uh, of discussion, this is our uh, energy uh, facility in uh, Ontario, East Ontario. And the grass, where, where you see the photo here, the grass is actually geothermal field. And uh, in, the, in front of us, where we are standing, standing there, this is our nuclear, uh, like we have small nuclear uh, 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 like uh, test facilities. But in the back, we have the ACE facility where we are able to test uh, energy systems in minus 40 to plus uh, 50 with different wind uh, technologies as well. So I look forward to welcoming you all in our uh, facilities and in Ontario. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Hossam, uh, for this at the end also a little bit um, different but very interesting application and very well developed and evolved applications. So in fact, integrated Hybrid systems are probably closer than we think. 
Uh, so with this, uh, we will enter a panel discussion. I would like to invite our panelists to, to turn on the, the videos again and switch on the mics. Uh, we had a lively discussion going on in question and answer session. Uh, we have received several very particular on the questions directed at uh, individual uh, panelists, and I have seen that most of those questions were already answered. Just to repeat to everybody in the audience, yes, the, the slides are available on the IFNEC site and also the recording of the panel will be available on the IFNEC site. Uh, so I would not open these particular questions which were already more or less answered, but I found one very interesting question that uh, targets broader audience. Uh, we had a question here from Paul Murphy and he asked about the European taxonomy question. So his question was how to further promote deployment of nuclear energy inside the European Union uh, within some states have nuclear power programs, some other states have ambitions to have nuclear power programs, while the European Commission at the same time he wrote uh, exclude nuclear from the technology from the clean energy taxonomy. In fact, it not excluded, but in fact, it did not include. So here is European particularity. Um, but I think this question interesting for all of us. So we are all talking about clean energy systems, uh, hybrid system between nuclear and renewables on the expert sites. On the other side, political, um, let's say, uh, audience, is not including nuclear at, loss, at, at least not in all parts of the world in the clean systems uh, or clean taxonomy, clean nomination. So I think this is a question to the global community as such. And I would invite maybe a few panelists to answer this. How can we attack this question? Uh, maybe I can start. Uh... I have uh, I posed uh, uh, an answer to this uh, to this question. I see it as a very important question, and uh, and the topic that has to be addressed, namely, the for the development of the of the nuclear option or for the uh, for the new builds, uh, it will be extremely important to for us investors to to be able to reach this uh, uh, these sustainable funds and. Uh, Therefore, in the European Union, uh, the, uh, the public consultation was started regarding, uh, regarding the taxonomy and the access to, this, uh, to these funds. And uh, uh, as to my knowledge, at the moment, nuclear is not excluded and is not also included into the, uh, uh, into the taxonomy. Uh, my, uh, uh, my idea would go into the way to, to stimulate the, uh, the nuclear uh, organizations, the Foratom, to, uh, to, uh, to stimulate our governments to, uh, uh, to reach consensus uh, and to uh, uh, be part of the process and try to reach an agreement so that the nuclear is recognized as a clean option, as an option that uh, uh, produces clean energy that uh, is an option that uh, that is sustainable in way to uh, to make our uh, economies more uh, uh, competitive uh, so that the energy uh, is available to our households uh, nuclear is an, uh, an option that uh, that has uh, that produces energy without the CO2 emissions is one of the cleanest energies that uh, that we produce and is also uh, uh, and also is 24/7 meaning it is uh, not dependent on on weather or any other or, or any other cause so uh, yes uh, we see it as an important that I uh, and I would really stimulate everybody to. Uh, to get into this uh, public this, uh, discussion and uh, and stimulate every, uh, the, our governments to um, to be part of it and uh, uh, put forward nuclear. Yes. Um, if, yeah, please, Shannon. If if I might just add one thing, and 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 that was very well stated, the value of stakeholder engagement, uh, the general public as well as policymakers. 
But I want to highlight the opportunity that we have across this community through a variety of different organizations and efforts, such as the Nice Future Initiative that I mentioned, to provide us with an opportunity to share lessons learned and best practices, what works, what doesn't work. And, and there may be some cultural differences in how we share uh, the value of nuclear and encouraging different decision makers to include language that focuses on non-emitting or low emitting technologies as opposed to renewable technologies and under get them to understand the difference in that language and how that can change the different options that come about. So I think we have an opportunity to, to learn from one another and how to accomplish this, this really significant challenge effectively. Thank you, Shannon, because this is just, uh, I was just trying to give a word to you and uh, say what nice future can play here, what the role a nice future can play here. But still, this is a simple question. How can country join nice future? Is it uh, some kind of uh, ticket to buy? No, and this is opt-in. You know, any of the initiatives within the Clean Energy Ministerial are opt-in. I would encourage you to uh, look at the website, uh, contact the different individuals that are identified on that website to learn a little bit more as to how you become a partner organization or a participant country. It's really not a difficult thing, but we would encourage more countries and more organizations to join those efforts because by broadening our reach, we can uh, be much more effective. Uh, so please take a look at that. Feel free to reach out to me or other contacts on that website and we'd be happy to provide further information. Thank you. Uh, there's also one which is directed a little bit to Kamil Tuchek or European. You are here representing also the research center within European Commission. And can you comment on this taxonomy question? At the same time, Europe is planning 65% of renewables, still a lot of nuclear, how the stability and this taxonomy goes together? Yeah, thank you, Tomas, and also uh, my predecessor for all, all, all these thoughts. Uh, well, it has been mentioned that uh, indeed in Europe we have a diversified opinion of the member states. Uh, we have a member states uh, uh, which are actually newcomers. Uh, they would like to develop uh, nuclear. We have uh, those uh, which would like to maintain, and we have those which are uh, facing out. Uh, we have also uh, in this context, a uh, diversified opinion about uh, the role of nuclear between the European institutions. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, um, I think that uh, uh, there has been evidence uh, put forward uh, uh, by uh, independent international bodies like uh, International Energy Agency, uh, like uh, World Energy Council, like uh, uh, international Panel for Climate Change, uh, which have highlighted that uh, indeed a nuclear and a nuclear in combination with renewables uh, can make a significant uh, contribution uh, uh, to the uh, combating of the climate change, but also to other policy objectives, in including uh, energy security, affordability, reliability, um, sustainability, uh, also in terms of the development goals. So uh, consider that we have uh, uh, one billion of uh, uh, inhabitants on our planet uh, which do not have access to the reliable electricity. Uh, consider that we have two billion uh, which do not have uh, uh, reliable access to the drinking water. And, uh, all these goals uh, can, be, can be addressed. So I think uh, here um, these options uh, should remain on the table. Okay, thank you for this view. Uh, so I'm looking at the questions uh, and there are of course different, one quite several questions are very technical going deeply into system and we will just, I would like maybe just as general example, uh, what kind of requirements for grid robustness for transforming the energy system from supplying the energy demand to optimizing the total system utilization including generation in nuclear renewable and storage. So. This is probably the question for system analysis, which were done around the globe, uh, or some yours is one of those. Um, maybe you can comment, were this analysis done? What are the requirements for the system? And uh, 
Yes, uh, thank you. Um, um, I, I believe that um, uh, the, the starting point for planning the deployment and impl uh, successful implementation projects is analysis of the requirements. And the typical requirements are uh, around the electric, thermal, and uh, uh, of course, hydrogen or fuel. Um, uh, and um, that the, the requirements can be reflected into uh, key performance indicators. So for example, the load uh, can be uh, the availability of the road, the reliability of the road, the intermittence uh, of, of uh, what uh, could be like uh, power not served or energy not served, in addition to other requirements, including the net present cost or the capital or the cost of the energy. Um, I have seen some of the questions uh, related, which is like, uh, do we have enough, for example, modular reactor that can support nuclear power plant? This is again part of the requirements. So of course, during outage, we are only covering the main class one or two or three, the main core requirements, not overall uh, uh, power requirements. So again, this can be reflected through the requirement. And the similar, I, I guess similar question is, uh, the simulation uh, uh, of like uh, availability of batteries and uh, flywheels. Uh, flywheel uh, is very reliable and uh, we have solutions to integrate uh, SMR, MMR with uh, fast charging stations with flywheel based on uh, demand and uh, requirement analysis. And uh, I guess this uh, can be represented in the modeling and simulation part, like what if scenarios. So uh, that is, can be configured and uh, can be reflected to the operational and control side. Okay, so we could go into in further into details here. We have a question here. Has anybody done a simulation? What will happen if Fessenheim goes out and the renewables go in? But I would not like to go into technical specific questions. I know that every country has done this and the But role... I just say I have simulation and published, so I would be happy to answer this yeah, separately. So Thank you. We all, uh, I mean, we're all here uh, in the field and we know the advantages nuclear can provide and is providing for the system. So maybe, for the panelists now a little bit different question this is a question about value proposition so we know what is currently value of nuclear in the system and what are the value of renewables in the system and we see that hybrid system nuclear and renewables certainly has some advantages for the nuclear in terms of probably communication visibility can we discuss about what would be value proposition for the renewables why would renewables want to be in the hybrid system and this is probably the question to all the panelists and um, whoever volunteers first, but I would really like to see the opinions of everybody here in the panel. So what is it in the hybrid system for renewables? Maybe Shannon, you are closest to this thing. So th that's a great question. And in fact, when we started looking at these uh, systems a few years ago, uh, I would say the renewable community didn't think there was much in them in these hydrogen in these hybrid systems that this wasn't really an opportunity it was more about opportunities for nuclear. I think we've come to understand one another much better and and come to an understanding that we offer different aspects to a, a hybrid system now most uh, renewable generators, uh, not all, but most renewable generators produce electricity. They don't provide high temperature heat. They don't provide steam. We look mostly at solar PV and wind and hydro. And, and by bringing in nuclear technology, another clean energy generation source, we can now begin to work together to, to look at the assets that we bring to a system to support not only electricity production, but also reducing the emissions associated with the industrial sector and transportation sectors. And by working together, we can ensure a reliable and resilient energy to all of those sectors. And so I think we're coming to an understanding that there's no one size fits all and there's no silver bullet, as we like to say, to solve all of these challenges. There's no single technology that can do it on its own. But working together, we can begin to support multiple energy sectors very effectively uh, for all of those different values that we put out. Thank you. Uh, can I have uh, one statement quickly? Yeah. Um, I, uh, that's absolutely uh, uh, right, and uh, I completely agree with Shannon. And also, in addition, that uh, some of the as a value proposition, like I discussed with a number of renewable technology providers, and uh, some applications they cannot actually address the problem, and those. Uh, uh, 
put them in a, in a limitation where they cannot actually provide a solution. And their only way to actually provide a complementary solution is by integrating SMR or MMR. So they, they, they might lose opportunity, business opportunity to integrate in a larger scale uh, if they are not able to reach that uh, capacity. Uh, so that, that it is, uh, I think, profitable based on the analysis we have done and optimization. The hybrid system offered the higher value and the, uh, like net present cost and also uh, energy. Uh, is it okay if I add a, a quick comment as well? So I mean, yeah. I, I'd also, also also add that I mean, I, I hinted at this a little bit in in, in the slides that I went through, but um, there are certain services that 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 variable new energy sources like wind and solar struggle to provide an inertia and frequency response and um, nuclear plants are well placed to provide that and, and that stability is really important because if you know the, the system doesn't have sufficient stability or resilience then it will fall over um, so it's you know uh, nuclear plants uh, along with um, biomass uh, and, and, and CCS um, have have the option to help um, kind of make the system more robust which which enables greater integration of revenue energy sources so it's, it's, it's good it's good news for everybody So maybe Daniel, a comment here. Yes, I, I agree with the, with the with the importance of this of this question. Uh, I uh, I firmly believe that uh, that uh, uh, the combination of uh, renewables and nuclear, and uh, this is uh, uh, also the practical experience that we have in. Uh, in our company is that uh, this combination is the is the right combination for the future in fact with the stability and the flexibility of nuclear we can accommodate in fact the the renewables into the system renewables uh, with uh, with their uh, uh, instability or uh, being dependent on the weather or, or sun wind or, or rain the, together with the, with the nuclear is the uh, is probably the only solution at the moment when we still do not have the uh, the sufficient amount of storage uh, for the electricity. The electricity has its uh, 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 is is the case when uh, uh, you have to produce as much as you consume at every second and. Uh, uh, for the moment, this is uh, this is still so. So uh, uh, I would be really happy to uh, renew uh, the, the renewables community would would recognize this benefit that they are uh, that they are getting from the stability and the, and the flexibility of the nuclear. So basically, this is it. Thank you, and Pablo. Yeah, one comment from my side is uh, similar to the other comments. It's. Um, Renewals need a complementary base load uh, power. It's a fact. Until there is enough storage, uh, and it's not in the near future any, anywhere, the, the feasibility of the storage capacity that could allow renewables to go to, let's say, above 50% or 70 or not even percent of the, of the energy supply. Until there's enough storage, renewables need a base load uh, complement. And that base load can be fossil or nuclear. So uh, there are no other options. So I, th I think that what is seen for the people endorsing renewables is that they need a base load complement and that better be nuclear than fossil. Thank you. Amil, do you have? You have the last floor here, last world. <laughs> <laughs> well, I fully agree with uh, all, all my panelists, uh, colleagues. Uh, indeed, I think that the key message here is uh, that uh, there is no competition. Uh, both nuclear and uh, renewables uh, can work uh, very nicely together. And here, uh, from the renewable side, indeed, the nuclear can uh, uh, very well uh, support uh, even higher penetration uh, of renewables uh, than we have uh, nowadays uh, in accordance uh, with the also scenarios where we want to go in terms of the how climate goes and uh, this is indeed uh, compatible uh, with uh, uh, the climate objectives uh, which we have uh, set us uh, and uh, other member countries uh, in the Paris Agreement. 
Thank you. Uh, with this, I would like to conclude this webinar. I would first of all like to thank all the panelists for their excellent contributions uh, with a lot of insight, a lot of new data and information. I think this was very informative also for the broader audience. I would like to thank all the participants uh, who posed some interesting questions and stayed with us to the end. And I would also like to invite you, uh, everybody back here again next week for the next IFNEC webinar. Next week, it will be on Wednesday, July 8th. And this webinar will be on the multinational repository concept, shared solutions for solving the radical waste management challenge facing emerging countries and those with small nuclear programs. So please visit IFNEC homepage, find the schedule and register for the next seminar, webinar. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you.